Hey, good morning, uh, good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Obviously, we have many international uh, attendees on this, so we'd like to welcome and thank you all for attending. Uh, and a warm welcome to our webinar. This is the first of a series of sector based webinars Meech will be hosting, and we hope you find this informative and engaging. Today we'll be going to be discussing the important and frankly quite disturbing topic of thermal runaway, a situation which all of us involved together in the battery sector aim strongly to avoid. We look at the dramatic effects if a thermal runaway event occurs and discuss its various potential causes. Then we'll explore a specific risk area linked with causing thermal runaway, which is less well known. And this is contamination during the manufacturing processes. Where can contamination occur? And crucially, how can it be removed? We'll then finish with a final Q&A, which will also include Professor Christensen. We hope you enjoy the webinar, find it informative, and we look forward to continuing the conversation on this and other related subjects. Just a quick introduction. My name's Ian Atkinson, and I work at a specialist engineering company called Meech International, based just outside Oxford in England. And we specialize primarily in electrostatic control and roll-to-roll -roll web cleaning, micro-contamination cleaning solutions. I don't think it's being overdramatic by saying we're going through a shift in society. Electrification will touch all of us on some scale within the next 10 years and future generations will only know some form of electric power um, for their devices and their vehicles. Rather like the shift when mobile phones and the internet changed all our lives, and already we're also seeing something else appear, the AI phenomenon. When we look at the EV and battery sector, the race is on, where early scaled up production of higher performance battery solutions in the new major markets of Europe and North America will have significant advantage. As a specialist in the sector, we can, we're constantly seeing new adapted technologies covering even higher density storage, more rapid charging, new faster and smaller footprint manufacturing processes, all developing rapidly, competitively, and actually quite independently under separate NDAs. So despite these commercial pressures, it is of course critical to ensure manufacturing quality is at its highest standard to deliver zero faults forwards downstream into firstly the first phase and then second life lithium ion batteries. Now I'm really pleased to present our special guest speaker today in this educational webinar. This is Professor Paul Christensen. Time doesn't allow me to fully share his achievements, but I would like to highlight the following. Paul is a leading scholar, professor of pure and applied electrochemistry at Newcastle University, and also a major international expert in lithium ion batteries, with respect in particular to their hazards and fundamentally the science of battery safety. He also has a proven track record in helping establish some major EV production lines, particularly in the north of England. Professor Christensen is a leading international figure in advising fire services, local authorities and other government agencies on the risks posed by lithium ion batteries. He's also a key member of the Faraday Institution's Safe Bat project. Hi, Professor Christensen. How are you, how are you doing today? Recovering from COVID, so <laughs> forgive any blunders. <laughs> I'll just um, I'll just unshare and get ready for you to share. OK, there we go. You. Good to see you. You're looking much better. Thank you very much. Couldn't look much worse. Um, this is actually being presented with my university hat on as part of the primarily the Safe Bat project, Safe Batteries of the Faraday Institution. So it's a it's a rapid glide through lithium ion batteries, the emerging risks. So first of all, what is a lithium ion battery? It's very simple. It literally is, consists just of a, a mixed metal oxide, in this case, lithium cobalt oxide, and graphite particles smeared onto current collectors. They are pressed either side of a, a very thin plastic porous separator, which is soaked in a mixture of organic solvents and lithium hexafluorophosphate. Literally all that happens is that the lithium ions are inside the mixed metal oxide when the battery is at zero state of charge. When you supply electricity, they move out, move through the separator and move into the graphite particles. 
and when you discharge the reverse happens. So simple it's called a rocking chair battery. But make no doubt about it, we've never seen anything like it in terms of the amount of energy per unit volume or per unit mass on this planet before. So this, in my day, batteries were batteries. You had a transistor radio battery, you had a torch battery. Now the battery is the largest unit, the battery or battery pack. The smallest unit is the cell, which comes in three principal shapes and sizes or form factors. Cylindrical cells typified by 18650, 18 millimetres diameter, 65 millimetres long. Uh, prismatic cells, about the size of a couple of 20 cigarette fag, pa fag packets. And pouch cells, which are about the size of an A4 sheet and about a centimetre thick. Only pouch cells were actually designed for use in EVs. The other two were primarily designed for small portable el electronic applications. Many cells make a module or less commonly a string. Many strings or modules make a battery or battery pack. What is thermal runaway? When a cell is abused by heating, crushing, penetration, overcharge or highly uh, relevant to Ian, defect or contamination produced at the manufacturing stage, then the SEI gets damaged again and you get those chemical processes superseding the electrochemical processes generating the gases again, the heat. The heat speeds up these processes exponentially, the red line, but heat can only be dissipated linearly, the blue line. Furthermore, heat is produced throughout the volume of the battery, but it's only dissipated through the faces of the battery. And this means that the bigger the battery, the more heat is retained. Once those two lines cross, you get a measurable temperature change. And that's how often we define thermal runaway in terms of say one degree centigrade rise per minute or one degree centigrade rise per second. Put three academics in a room, you'll get five views of what thermal runaway is. But in, this end, in essence, what you're looking at is uncontrolled positive feedback, thermal runaway, which is challenging, if not impossible, to stop. And differentiate between thermal runaway and thermal propagation. Thermal propagation is the heat propagating between cells and triggering thermal runaway in adjacent cells. You do not need fire for that. You do not need fire. So your cylindrical cells and your, pris and your uh, prismatic cells have little vent caps, <coughs> excuse me, safety caps, which burst. Pouch cells simply burst. When that happens, the gases that have been produced at high pressure, because there's a lot of them, vent from the cells and take with them small droplets of the organic solvent which give the gases this milky white appearance. Make no doubt about it, that's the vapour cloud. And where there's a vapour cloud, you can get a vapour cloud explosion. And of course, these are occurring on land, on and under the sea and in the air as a result of lithium ion batteries going into thermal runaway. So this shows you what happens if that vapour cloud ignites immediately. This is a single module, there's 24 in the Nissan Leaf, and that hammer weighs 23 kilograms. What you see there are long flare like flames preceded initially by the blasting out of the heavy metal nanoparticles, which is not black smoke, it's the black nanoparticles. The vapor cloud ignites immediately and you get three or four meter long flames because there's a lot of gas produced. So it's produced at very high pressure. That gives you an idea of the kind of energy. And this is what happens if the gas doesn't ignite immediately. And this shows you just how much is produced. From my own research and literature research, between 500 and 6,000 litres per kilowatt hour. There goes the heavy metal nanoparticles, and now we get the buoyant vapour cloud. You always get two forms, a buoyant form and a lighter than air form, but only one of these dominates. We can't predict which yet, but it does simply be based upon chemistry amongst other things. The lower explosion limit is 6 to 11%, but that is much, much higher than the immediate danger to life and health. And this was part of a series of experiments we did over three weeks in spring of 2021. So you've got a lot of gas coming off. Now, in fact, leaving aside crashes because people don't understand the torque of electric vehicles, there's, no been, there's been no deaths directly attributable to the lithium ion batteries of electric vehicles. So briefly touching on the report that was published just in uh, February, actually, of this year, 
uh, by myself, my PhD student, Malcolm Wise, and my right-hand man, Dr. Morozik. Um, we were looking at the use of second life electric vehicle batteries, and this really shocked me, This the results of this survey. So just to give you an idea, if you take an electric vehicle battery and you put it into a second electric vehicle without doing anything, that's called reuse. If you take out any dodgy modules and send them off for materials recycling, replace them and put them back into an electric vehicle, that's remanufacture. If, however, you take your battery, take out the modules that are dodgy, send them off to materials recovery, and then assemble a new battery pack for a new purpose, that's called repurposing. And this is all down to the fact that electric vehicles their batteries are deemed as being no longer suitable for use in an EV when they reach about 80% state of health. In other words, when they've lost irreversibly 20% of their capacity, but they're still valuable and they've still got huge amounts of energy. And the drivers for that second life are enormous, both commercially, but most particularly in terms of the environment. They, uh, they can have a major a positive effect in terms of reducing greenhouse gases, etc. And there is a massive market for these systems. They're apparently flying off the shelves of scrap yards. My worry is the do-it-yourself market for battery energy storage systems, etc. And there have been commercial systems explored in Germany. We've had a DIY one burn in the UK. We had two commercial systems in Australia fail, one of which went into thermal runaway, producing the vapour cloud, but without fire. And the thermal imaging camera used by the fire service couldn't locate the heat source because the vapour cloud masked it, which was a new result that we hadn't realised before. And of course, there's been tens of thousands of residential battery energy storage systems recalled in this country, America, and in Australia and New Zealand. What I concluded was there were six elephants in the room stupid things that are blatantly obviously stupid but exist essentially we know that charging rapid charging of electric vehicles reduces the thermal stability but there is a drive to ever faster rapid charging there's a flourishing and unregulated trade in cells online but also full electric vehicle battery packs both of these should be killed dead type tests that are employed by all international standards etc don't work with second life batteries because they get hammered in their first life. And indeed, the British Standards Institute has recognised that the lack of any kind of test is a major glaring gap. And the IEC and the EU completely avoid the issue of safety, basically relying only on the information from first life. And it's the Wild West outside, uh, out there in terms of regulations and standards. It really is. And undoubtedly unsafe lithium ion batteries from electric vehicles are actually being transported. So that's the whistle stop tour. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Paul. I think um, I think that's quite alarming for all of us. And I think, uh, you know, we've it's really food for thought across the industry, isn't it? And the, the message about regulations actually catching up with the industry is uh, is certainly something that we all need to think about. But at the same time, I think we also um, need all to do our bit and ensure that we, wherever, whatever stages we're involved in the manufacturing stages, we help to ensure that the quality is there in the first stage battery life so now, um, so that those batteries being produced now are then going to be moving into second life um, with the best possible quality. Well, I absolutely agree. But also, you know, as I said, there's been recalls of tens of thousands of of home battery systems across three different countries, continents, because of problems with defects and contamination introduced at the manufacturing stage. So, yes, it's absolutely essential. Yeah. And it's not just EVs that we're talking about, is it? We're talking about the future of electrical appliances um as you've already mentioned scooters as well of course but um a much broader scope of uh of devices around the home oh yeah absolutely i mean power tools are starting to burn now as well and we've had at least one incident in a mine where they were charging power tools next to each other and essentially it, they they went up and set the whole room underground room on fire so they're they're in all 
levels of our society from e-cigarettes right the way up to grid scale battery energy storage systems, right the way up to ships and submarines, full battery ships and submarines and even flying cars. Would you believe? Incredible, incredible. Um, just to just to continue then with um, the the very. Well, alarming, but you know. There, there are some regulations there for the first phase. Um, <clears throat> first life batteries and so there is regulation in place but let's remember that thankfully EV fires are very rare and what you've seen is um, disturbing as we said at the beginning of the presentation but it is something that I like we all like to think we are all going to be working towards to improve the regulations um, all the way through so that we've got a long healthy uh, future ahead. Um, as Professor Christensen said uh, the storage of energy now in these compact spaces is huge. So we do need to be very, very cautious. Problems occur if a short circuit occurs. Um, and we've been looking at the EV um, market where we've seen vehicles bursting into flames with no warning. And these images, alarming images, show you what can occur. Uh, you may have also picked up um, Paul's uh, commentary on it doesn't have to be flame uh, levels of temperature to actually cause thermal runaway or even transfer from one cell to another. So you, you've got a, an image here of the ferry on the right hand side where um, one car had gone into thermal runaway and then that spread from not only cell to cell but vehicle to vehicle and eventually this ferry actually had to be abandoned. Um, Paul also highlighted you know that it can take weeks for a, a vehicle to burn out so um, one event can be very, very high profile in the media. So if we actually also look at the. One moment, please just move this on. If we also look at the main causes of thermal runaway. Um, Paul mentioned abuse, um, heat, crushing, penetration, and you saw those uh, recreated in some of the experiments, as well as obviously some of the dramatic um, collisions, um, overcharging, but also defects, and that's including contamination in the cells. So here you can see um, the various scales of components and breakaway particles that can be picked up in the various processes in what would be a typical uh, lithium ion battery cell um, production flow. But is there is there a typical um, production flow? Probably not, because in our experience, working with many different partners under NDA, um, there are so many competing technologies. And so often you have to customize your approach, customize your solution and really work hard to understand um, the challenges that have been fa faced in different technologies in different stages. Now, we talked about also the separator film being critical. Uh, if a separator film is in the range of 10 to 40 microns thick, then it's understandable how an inclusion particle uh, from 10 to 100 microns when compressed within the final wound cell so in this final one cell area effectively can imprint or even penetrate that membrane now if an inclusion is compressed into the into the separator film it may not affect the performance for many charge discharge cycles so you could be running it it may have passed its um its soak test at the end of production it may be it may be operating effectively in its first life maybe even into its second life, but the material has been weakened and it's feasible that a shortage can then occur without warning. Other areas of um, structural defects that occur can occur within the manufacturing process are intermittent delamination. And this is an area where um, obviously it can have an impact on the productivity and the yield. Inclusion particles, as we've just talked about, can be picked up from many different sources and we'll have a look at the different stages in a moment. So here's some uh, examples here picked up and embedded in cathode or in the anode. Also burrs on cut edges from the slitting process. Um, you know, can they be carried forward? Uh, we, we believe if not um, removed or going through some form of process, perhaps some form of contact cleaning, which can actually flatten that cut. Um, these can be also damaging and, and cause damage to the separator film. Coating mix may be inconsistent. There's another uh, example 
um, and all of these can affect the battery efficiency and the production yield. But as we said, they can also affect, lead to potential short circuits. So if we have a look at again a what we deem to be a typical lithium ion production process. Um, you can have a look at the different flows um, from anode and cathode, from mixing through to coating, calendaring, slitting, roll formation, and cell assembly. And all of these um, all of these uh, exclamation marks are highlighting the potential hazards or contamination and the requirement to remove it. Now we often need a lot of engineering work to customize solutions as well. And so I would say these are none of these are typical solutions. These are solutions that we typically have to customize and develop in partnership with each partner. So it's uh, it's never straightforward. And one major factor is should we be looking at contact cleaning or non contact cleaning? And we'll have a look at that in a moment. So as per the previous slide, this shows a wide scope of contamination risk areas. We've got pre coating. So this is the uh, the copper or the aluminium foil. We can't we don't want that to be contaminated anyway um, prior to the coating layer being being added. Also, um, the coating roller itself uh, also needs to be cleaned. We're talking about micro tolerances perhaps even down to two microns on the coating to maintain the integrity and effectiveness of the high density storage cell. So we may also need to have to clean the uh, the coating roller so that it doesn't affect that caliper um, thickness. Recalendering, so cleaning before the coating material is compressed at, a, at a, an exact tolerance to actually activate that coating. We don't want any any product, any contamination to then be embedded in that coating. Post slitting, this is a major area of in process contamination, and we'll have a look at that in a moment. Post cutting, stamping, laser cutting of electrodes, um, so uh, a tab or notch uh, cutting, for example, again, a major area of contamination. And of course, cleaning and static control on the separator film which is obviously a, the critical uh, layer, which if it picks up a, a high static charge could potentially lead to um, a, uh, a static discharge and even burn and damage the material just through the buildup of static. Let's have a look in a bit more detail. Um, Pre-coating and coating roller cleaning. So thickness and quality of the coated web is essential to maintain a uniform structure within the EV battery. Any contamination within the coating would affect the performance within the structural layers. And as you can see here, we'd recommend cleaning solution before the coating to, to prevent any em embedded contamination in the coating. And as we said before, also cleaning the roller. But already you can see there would typically be a different approach. So um, it may well be non-contact cleaning. So a high powerful airflow um, positive and negative airflow, um, breaking the boundary layer and removing dry unbonded contamination on the so dust, ambient dust, that sort of thing on off the surface of the, uh, the copper or the aluminium foil prior to going into the coating. On the roller, however, you may well have some more challenging contamination because of the heat involved. It may well be more embedded, so it may be semi bonded in which case we would consider and promote uh, the use of contact cleaning. And we'll go into details of the sort of products that we're talking about in a moment. During this stage, the web and the coating layers are compressed together in the calendaring stage uh, to the exact required thickness, which also activates the coating on the web itself. So cleaning prior to this critical stage prevents contamination being trapped in the coating, which could result in the coating layer being out of tolerance. So you can see perhaps non-contact cleaning prior to this stage and perhaps contact cleaning on the roller. Now, the debate between contact and non-contact cleaning really does depend on a number of factors. So particularly the type of contamination um, and of course the sensitivity of the material that you're cleaning. Um, but we have a, a in the industry, there is a range of different solutions that can be uh, you know, adapted and trimmed to the different requirements. And we'll go into that in a moment. 
So the slitting process can create a lot of debris uh, made up of a combination of base material and coating material, if you remember the slides earlier. High contaminant, this is a high contamination risk stage where cleaning really is imperative. So um, we, we see the adoption downstream being varied, but this is absolutely critical for the industry that at this stage we know there is always contamination. So depending on the process and the materials, contamination could be bonded or unbonded, like we said before, requiring careful analysis to choose the optimum contact or non-contact web cleaning solution. Slitting dust is highly likely in this area, and as most co as some coating materials have toxic content, special consideration is also needed for the removal of toxic dust and the handling of that dust. Also bearing in mind this is typically in a clean room environment. So certainly we would expect this typically more to be um, involving contact cleaning, a bro rotating brush cleaning solution mounted over the roller, as you can see in this scenario here. And here's a scenario where we have potentially an enhanced air handling unit, which is critical to provide the positive and the negative air flows balanced perfectly to the different uh, settings needed for different contamination. But in this case, this also has a bag in bag removal process within the clean room. So if you're removing that potentially toxic dust, it can be removed without recontaminating the clean room and potentially without exposing uh, the operator, of course. Similar to the post slitting stage during the electrode cutting, particles and debris can contaminate the web. Uh, in order to avoid this web cleaning at this stage, will clean the surface of the substrate, leading to a clean and clear separation layers. And the same considerations as before also um, must be taken into account for the removal and containment of potentially toxic dust. But again, the, we've got contact cleaning, non-contact cleaning solutions available, um, also respecting the sensitivity of the material and the coating. So, and of course, depending on the type of contamination. So. There isn't a solution which which fits all, bearing in mind all of the different technologies out there. Um, so our approach and any approach should be to closely consult with any supplier of these cleaning solutions to ensure that you, you match it perfectly. This porous membrane um, has to be placed between the electrodes of opposite polarity and therefore it's and it's permeable to ionic flow, but crucially, it prevents electric contact of the electrodes. So any failure of separator film results in the start of a short and therefore a buildup of current flow and eventually the film will run away. So removal of contamination on this more sensitive substrate is crucial. So typically this would be a non-contact cleaner um, cleaning both sides of the separator film just before it goes into the winding stage. Now, obviously, we'd still be looking to clean the anode and the cathode because you don't want any contamination in there, but this is just highlighting the different approach. Within contact uh, or uh, non-contact cleaners, also you typically have um, static control. So you're neutralizing any static charge, particularly on these insulated separators. You wouldn't necessarily need them on the anode or cathode, the, the filmic metal filmic based um, uh, substrates. So not only would you be looking to remove the contamination, you'd also be ensuring they go they are wrapped into the cell with a neutral charge. Also just highlighting other options in the industry. One thing you might want to do is to demonstrate that you um, are supplying a material into the cell, which is actually definitely neutral. So this is also data logs, the performance of static control bars. So you can actually monitor um, the effective performance of the, of the uh, neutralization of this material going in there. So you have a clean and also neutralized uh, cell, and you can actually demonstrate that with evidence-based data logging. Also, if needed, if as you have a variation in, in static charges built during the process, it can also be paired with a sensor so it can be automatically adjusting and ensuring and guaranteeing that neutral charge. So we just have a quick um, summary of the main questions that you need to ask and review when evaluating the different cleaning options. Contamination type, 
It needs to be dry and unbonded or dry and semi-bonded. Anything oil-based or, um, or wet wouldn't be compatible with the typical cleaning solutions in, in, in inline solutions that we're talking about. The contamination size, um, cleaning down to, for example, you know, 0.5 microns. But of course, you can also have large delaminated layers. And so you may want a solution that also breaks up that material. So these are all the sort of things that would be re reviewed on a consultative basis. Sensitivity of the anode, the cathode and the separator film. Um, how sensitive is that to a contact cleaning system, for example, with a rotating brush? Um, but of course, that then would also drive the selection of the different specs available. So it really is a consultative process. How, how low is the uh, web tension? Um, we're talking about mounting a system over a web, which is perhaps running at very high speeds as the productivity increases. Um, so this, this may be a factor and a consideration, and we may want to mount a solution over a roller so that web tension is absorbed. Is there toxic uh, contamination in the dust? Does that need to be managed? And do we need to assist with a solution which will prevent recontamination in the clean room? What's the space like in the environment on the machine, but also for the air handling units? Getting to know, getting the right solution up front, obviously, will ensure a quick and efficient installation and a long life performance. So, essential range of solutions to meet all of these different requirements um, is available in the industry. Um, so, you, you're going to need a broad, dry, room compatible range of cleaners. Non-contact cleaning, uh, non-contact low tension web cleaning. Contact cleaning with dry room specification. Um, dry room is often critical, particularly on the cathode. All linked to a digitally controlled air handling unit. So absolute control, and of course, this needs to be potentially integrated with the, uh, the main machine controls so that you have one central human machine interface, and you can then control and adapt from there. And as we said, optional toxic dust containment. So just a quick overview of typical arrangements in the non-contact cleaning range um, in the industry. Now these are Meech solutions, but this is an educational webinar, so we do want you to reflect on other alternatives, but these these are the wider range available. Cyclean is a non-contact cleaning solution, double sided cleaning. Uh, the web travels from left to right. Um, neutralized through ionization bars, positive airflow and negative airflow, giving a very dynamic um, cleaning effect on the boundary layer and the, the surface of the web. So the contamination is then removed and carried away to an air handling unit where you can safely filter, store and contain that potentially toxic contamination. Now, one thing factor with this is this does depend on quite high tension web. If you have wider web or the web is, is quite a long distance between the rollers or it's low tension, then you may need to mount a cleaner over a roller. And this is where this solution, the Cyclean R comes in, where you can actually mount applying exactly the same principles, positive and negative airflow with a, with a powerful dynamic uh, airflow in removing the contamination. And this is focused on that surface point over the roller. With no risk of marking the web. Just to show you the effectiveness of this sort of solution, this is actually showing a printed toner, um, which I think we can all relate to being very dramatic, very difficult to remove when it's embedded in paper, for example. As you can see, that very easily picks up this dry, very fine but unbonded contamination. And it's just an indication, but I think we can all relate to just how difficult that, that is. The other alternative is a new development, and this is particularly in line with the demands from the battery market. And this is a product called RoClean, which is a rotating brush servo controlled, so it can be interfaced with the uh, the, the local machine manufacturer. Um, 
uh, rotating in the opposite direction to the direction of the web. It's also combined with ionization bars for, to neutralize the web on entry and exit, but also positive airflow and negative airflow, all linked then to an air handling unit which digitally controls the system. Now, this is typically for um, dry semi bonded uh, material. And you can see a little bit of the video here just showing the, the typical components. Now, the brush system can be varied based on the different material types. It's a, it can be dry room specification. Uh, the adjustment of the manifold means you can actually just touch the surface or you can actually go into the surface more deeply. We can also adjust the hardness of the brush, the material types and the fiber diameter and so on. So there are many, many variables as well as the airflows and the rotation speeds. So this is very effective, um, not only with um, semi quite sensitive material, but also more challenging contamination. So that I think in terms of time um, concludes the presentation, but here's just a few images of the sorts of substrates that we're looking at where we're all very focused on removing this contamination to ensure that we avoid this thermal runaway event. And there are many different stages. And as I said, we can actually work with different manufacturers to ensure that they fit perfectly and are integrated within the lines. So at this stage, I think we have a number of questions waiting for us um, based both on the thermal runaway uh, presentation and also on the sort of solutions that, that are provided in the industry for contamination removal. So Q&A. So Q&A, right, we have a few coming through. And so any long-term aging tests uh, regarding potential adverse effects of cleaning solutions. Um, so I, I think the question here is, um, adverse effects of the cleaning solution. So um, uh, could we actually be introducing um, some damage into the material, that sort of thing? I don't think there are, but what I would say is on a case by case, obviously we don't just jump in with a solution. We actually spend a lot of time testing in our laboratory, but also with um, strategic partners to actually test the uh, the cleaning solution on their substrate. So. Typically, we would go. We would not only be looking at how, what sort of contamination we're removing, but also um, closely inspecting any potential surface damage based on the use of the equipment. So, it is very much. It's not something we. It's not a quick off-the-shelf solution. It's very much something that we would work with the uh, either the machine manufacturer or the battery manufacture themselves and then typically they will take samples of the substrate offline and then closely examine that um, you know on a microscopic scale so there is a rigorous a level of rigor that we go through um, to to ensure that the equipment is appropriate for the long life um, you know uh, manufacturing process um, if there's a if we're waiting for some other questions, there were some other questions that we had received from our uh, our network um, prior to this. Um, well, this. These are questions for you, Paul, actually. Um, is there any data on the EV fires which shows likely causes? So does it split um, by collisions, battery management system um, or cell manufacturing faults? Is there any data that you've seen in your research? <clears throat> well, actually, uh, there's an organisation called EV FireSafe, which is funded by the Australian Defence Ministry and it's run by a, a lady firefighter, Emma Sutcliffe. They collate a lot of data um, and the, the the problem with spontaneous events is we don't know because by the time you get to try and look at the battery, it's burned out, obviously. Um, the yeah, suspicion yeah. with spontaneous incidents is that they are down to contamination or defects introduced at the manufacturing stage. Otherwise, you've then got overcharge due to failure of the of the battery management system during charge. Um, and of course, you've got 
road traffic collisions, driving over debris, things like that. Um, and I think that probably encapsulates most of the incidents that have taken place. That, that example that you showed us where um, that vehicle had gone over debris and then very quickly it went into thermal runaway. Um, that, of course, had that not been on, on video camera, we you wouldn't have known that that was the cause, would you? Oh, no, absolutely and, not. And so um, that wasn't a manufacturing defect that, in that case. Yeah, the driver realised that he'd driven over something. He just didn't realise what the implications were. And of course, since then, yeah. most electric vehicles have got some form of protection underneath to protect the battery case from just such debris like an incidents on the road. Another question that we received was um, around with all of the many different competing cell designs and now the many different competing manufacturing processes. I mean, they're not in the public domain because every everything is under NDAs. Um, so one of the problems with that is it um, it ma makes it very difficult to set and establish meaningful uh, mandatory standards that everyone has to comply with. Um, how do you think I industry is going to to manage this? And will will a governing body, um, you know, enforce future standards? Because you've just shown it's critical to have um, a, a a level of major quality rigor in these processes. Well, I mean, there there are standards um, around, for example, uh, passing what's called the pool fire test, where the pack has to withstand a pool fire for at least five minutes. And most, if not all EVs currently produced will pass that, or the packs will pass that test. Uh, the problem is exactly as you've identified, and it's not just about quality, it's about recyclability, second life, uh, reducing wastage, because we're caught in some pretty hard pincers here. We don't have an extensive recycling, remanufacture, repurposing industry across the world. And we certainly don't in the UK. We do have some uh, companies who are doing this, but it's very nascent. Yet we're having these electric vehicle packs now starting to appear uh, post it first life. Um, mm, mm. But they're in all shapes, sizes and forms. They have to be sent for materials recovery because mm. the cells are all glued and soldered together. Which I, I suppose, so, in a way, safeguards them from going on into that second market. Well, uh, Tesla for, for makes Tesla. no bones about it. Yeah, they say, yeah. Look, our battery should be go for materials recovery, you know, yeah. and and they're and, the, and thereby avoiding all these safety issues. So you can understand that logic, but in terms of saving the planet, um, it's mm. perhaps a tad short-sighted. Yes. Uh, and we do need, we do need standards. We do need regulations. But it's difficult to see how you can do that. Of course, in this country, we rely on essentially voluntary standards, um, mm. which when they become regulations are backed up by law. In America, it's more about voluntary standards and proving that you are following standards to get people to buy your product. Um, but the, the fact is that as we move away from the kind of established manufacturers, highly responsible, highly experience to other manufacturers with perhaps less experience, less less understanding, then we could be hitting far, far more problems of safety. So at the moment, to my feel, it's a bit like the Wild West. Yes, yeah, as you as you mentioned it. Yeah, um, you, you actually, I think, to some degree answered one of the questions we've had was about the difference between in standards between major regions like Europe, US uh, and Asia. Um, so uh, you've suggested that actually th there is no global standard. It's regional and to some degree voluntary in some cases. Yes, I mean, um, what we tend to do in this country is to adopt either IEC uh, standards or the EU and turn them into BSEN, for example. Um, essentially, which is a good idea. If something works, don't fix it, pinch it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But no problem yeah. with that at all. But. Where they don't work, for example, IEC 6338 and 6330 and the EU batteries regulation that covers second life batteries, in my view, have completely missed the point. They've sidestepped the key issue because they do, do not in any way, shape or form require testing. 
They rely only on information from the battery management system from First Life. And we've just now started to see articles appearing in trade magazines that OEMs are reluctant in the extreme to release this information because it's valuable intellectual property. So where does that leave you? With IEC 6330, 6338 and the yes. EU batteries regulation, that's all you've got to try and prove the safety of a second life electric vehicle battery. So is there any data suggesting that older batteries are more prone to thermal runaway if there is a defect or is it more likely to become apparent in early life? Well, that's a very good question because it leads on to a paper I was just reading this morning, actually. There's too little research on the effect on thermal stability of lithium ion batteries of ageing and use. Calendar ageing is where it happens all the time, irrespective, uh, and that's benign. Generally, if you cycle your battery within the manufacturer's limits, it should be OK. But if you rapid charge and you start depositing lithium metal, which shouldn't be present in a lithium ion battery, you do destabilize it. But as I said, there was an interesting paper this morning on what should have been a fairly stable lithium ion battery. They did aging tests. And what actually happened was that, as you've mentioned before, the separator delaminated it's a mm. ceramic polymer separator the ceramic and the polymer delaminated and this reduced the temperature for which thermal runaway starts from 200 degrees centigrade to 100 degrees centigrade and mm. also mm. resulted in a far more violent um, thermal runaway reaction in terms of the ejection of material fire and flame so this is a major question the effect of defects of of the effect of aging, of cycling, of use of rapid charging on electric vehicle batteries is a major, major gap in our knowledge. And we are about to hit the point where it could become very important, particularly when we start seeing backstreet garages trying to repair elderly electric vehicles, etc. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Well, Paul, I think we're 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 about on the, uh, the limit now for, for the time for this webinar, but um, I think the, there's some strong messages there in terms of um, you know the importance of um, critical quality management um, upstream at key stages in manufacturing. Um, obviously, um, the importance of improved regulations globally, and perhaps some standardisation and um, consistency. Um, but also crucially going into the uh, into the second life um, market. So we'd like to thank you for, for being our guest speaker. Um, it's been very, very informative and much appreciated. And I hope everyone on the webinar has appreciated it. And you may have other questions, so please do drop those questions to us. We will then field those. We will get you an answer and we'll circulate those back. But um, and we'd like to continue this conversation. Um, so we will certainly be at the battery show. Um, in Europe and on 23rd to the 25th of May, um, along with I'm sure many of you and uh, and please reach out to us and speak to us. But Paul, we're really grateful for your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.